All right, hello and welcome to Evans Imagines, uh, negative ass antimatter. How does and yeah? So this is the first lecture, but um, first, yeah, I wanted to kind of introduce myself, um, what this is, and um, then we'll get into the first lecture and all that stuff. Uh, okay, so um, what this particular thing, negative mass antimatter, is is a a six hour segment of one of my rants. And the reason I'm making these series is so that I don't have to rant at somebody for six hours and they can kind of uh, get the idea because not very many people have that kind of time for the idea. Um, I have a lot of these rants, like uh, at least two, three um, that I can just immediately do. So I figured I'd just do them. And so I make a little series about it. So this is my series, Evans Imagine. Um, thank you to my wife for the graphic. And yeah, I have a lot of good rants. This one is my best, so that's why I'm leaving off with it. Also, uh, yeah, I missed this slide somehow. But yeah, it's for anybody, this class. Like, what is this class? What are these series of classes? You just kind of have to have a background in science to the extent that you're interested in it. Um, beyond that, like, just send me emails if you're confused or like, uh, otherwise read up. I'll, I'll cite things and say things and you can click them. Um, I think actually, I, never mind. This is a, uh, probably a movie. So Google them. That's how I found them. Um, and uh, I'll see if I can figure out a way to get the PowerPoint uh, linked up as well. But I haven't thought of that yet. But yeah, this is a time capsule of what I've learned about negative mass antimatter. When I was looking through the, the literature, it was like Dirac worried about it a little bit. That's like 1931. Einstein had worried about it a little bit, but only in 1913 didn't care about it at all by 1931. Um, I guess 1913 through 18, but he, he get, you know, he was done with it. He, he associated it with being his biggest shame. So we'll come back to that later. But um, so it's like every 20 years, somebody cares about it. Then uh, after 30s, you have 54, uh, Bondi cares about it a little bit. And then in the 70s, I don't think anybody really returns to it until maybe 80s. And then you have this a uh, wild series of guys that are just amazing, all of them independently at once. But okay, so email me, Boney E, last name, first initial, at alum.mit.edu. I am an MIT alum, I guess I should also say at some point. I studied physics and chemistry there as well as math, but they made it so you had to pay for more than four years to get a third major. So I didn't get the math with computer science major that I had for three and a half years, even though thank you to Hartley Rogers for being an amazing um advisor and my first experience with an archaleptic okay um yeah told you guys this okay so yeah, this is pretty a fun a fun class in itself this is about epistemological frameworks so when pitching someone a six-hour crazy idea the first thing you have to agree upon is that you're not that crazy or that your craziness is within some sort of realm of craziness that is fine so um, that's what we're doing here. We're going to talk about the three different types of epistemological framework. Number one, the thing you probably heard about in high school, if you have that level of remembrance, it's been a long time for everybody. Um, I had to reread it myself to find out what people thought, because it's been a while since I thought about it. Uh, but the scientific method, a lot of people think about it, have done their you know, middle school science fair projects. They did an experiment. They tested a hypothesis. They got excited about it. So we have to talk about Bacon and the context in which um, the scientific method is useful. Uh, newsflash, it's like 400 years old, guys. So it's not, it's not what is right. Uh, it's very old and it's very old thinking by very rich people. And that's a problem. You have to have better thoughts than that. So Popper had better thoughts than that in the early 20th century. I mean, not that far away from Kuhn, like 10, 20 years in real life. But there's a gap in terms of their acceptance. So Popperian epistemology we'll talk about next is more of uh, more about rejection of hypotheses. That's how we actually move forward is with new ideas and um, not just new ideas, but testing old ideas and finding out they're wrong. So we're left with an ever improving core of not yet wrong theories, but that's all we can say about them. So a little positivism, always like that. And then we have Kuhn, who upsets the apple cart. I love myself some Kuhn. Um, don't have enough Kuhnian guys in positions of power yet. I guess it's unclear how it propagates power. That's kind of the problem, right? I mean, it's about disruptions in, in uh, paradigm. So let's go through these three things that I have now talked about way too much. Um, yeah, still recording, just making sure. Okay, so yeah, first scientific method. You guys remember this from high school? Sir Francis Bacon, 
it's not going to be incidental to the things we talk about later that he is a pretty rich Sir Francis Bacon. Uh, his idea is that testing hypothesis, confirmation, rejection, equally valuable, do experiments. Do experiments, I mean, this is back when we're given guys, you do an experiment, you get your name remembered forever. Um, remember you had like all these chemist laws who were still teaching kids, like this proportionality is anybody, every different culture has somebody whose law this was, but it's Gay-Lussac's law or it's Charles or Boyle's law. Come on guys, like this is like colonialism in the classroom. But anyway, back on track. You'll, you'll see a lot of these little mini rants. Um, but yeah, so the idea is you use induction, you do more more experiments, test more hypotheses, more and more. It's not that directed though, right? It's kind of weird, like, ah, let's just do some science kind of thing. Um, but actually, like, the, I, I want to spend more time on the less well part, well known part of his work, because you guys have all done science fair projects, you know what they're about. And it's not right, so I don't want you to get excited about it. Um, but in, in this work, there was something that I think is more profound that was less well known because the, the Popperian people didn't like this part. Um, he talked about idols that are, people have and how that can be a problem when you're doing experiments, right? Because you can't see past the idols that you have. So you have these various categories of idol. And I don't really think his categorization is awesome. Maybe it was for 1620. I have no idea what life was like back then. It's not great for now. I haven't particularly tried to do now, but I do think it's important what he's saying here and like the, the category of errors that are that he's enumerating because we still make these categories of error. So I'll try to draw a modern parallel here uh, based on what I read on Wikipedia, more or less. You can go read it too. Basically, idols of the tribe. We've created order out of nothing that's meaningless, right? Nationalities are essentially meaningless. And nonetheless, I like the World Cup. You like the World Cup? probably your version of the World Cup. I mean, I also like League of Legends to an extent. So I watched the world, whatever it was, um, splits just now last weekend. Congratulations to Edward Gaming. Uh, but so there's this weird tendency to create order in teams and stuff. Um, that's not real. Um, there's narrative fallacies related to that, right? Like we love great people. We make Elon Musk a guy who's a billionaire and like we gave him all his billion dollars in loans. Yeah, he still has billions of dollars. You give me billions of dollars in loans and I don't lose it and I'm a great guy. Oh, what do we get out of it? We get electric cars. Well, that's good. He didn't kill the electric car. He made it cool. So that's something. Anyway, so Idols of the Cave. Um, tendency to avoid personal dislikes. So Einstein, I think, was pretty saddled by this with quantum mechanics. For some reason, there was something about the initial setup of it. Never got into it. And I, same thing with me. I just don't feel topology. There's no like... It doesn't, I, I didn't have a good enough teacher earlier enough in my life, or I don't have the visual as, maybe it's the visualization. Like uh, there's just something missing. I'm not gaining. I do linear algebra. I can do any other math thing really well, but topology kills me. I, I just don't. So yeah, yeah, I, sh I, I tell you that. And then I'm going to tell you about how I don't like general relativity, which is kind of a non Euclidean topology. And that's not incidental. Um, idols of the marketplace. Problem of existing categories. This is really important. It's always a problem for everybody. We need to think about this in every situation and context. So uh, mass, energy, these words are like, oh, these are still 17th century words. These are very, very old words. Um, and yeah, if you reread books from a long time ago, that's one reason I'm talking to you because I feel like maybe my conversation will be more um, discernible in 50 to 100 years than my writing because the ideas are like, oh, they go by so fast. Like you read them and it's like, what was this guy trying to say? What were the contexts of these words, these Haldanes, another sir, but I liked his style. He was trying to think of what is life in like the early 1900s, right before we had any chance of learning what life was like or was for. Schrodinger did a nice pee into that in 1950s called his thing, what is life too. Uh, good. It's good to be on that, that thinking out. Maybe I'll do a what is life someday, uh, but okay. Idols of the theater, uh, yeah, ooh, we have these still, but it's not really the theater, it's the academy is the, the equivalent now. Um, Love of Einstein, grant committees, grant reports, the things that keep life churning. These are what I would call the equivalents. And I'm also giving away that I'm a Kuhnian guy, if you know the whole deal. Uh, so yeah, the epistemological frameworks, hmm, I thought I'd move the top here. Anyway, uh, we're talking about Pop Popper now, Sir Karl Popper. We got two sirs here and then a guy who's not a sir because he did not. Well, uh, hmm, I guess I don't know for sure that he isn't. Uh, but anyway, so falsification is what Popper got very right and why he's so rightly uh, lauded in the community. I didn't find out about him until I was in grad school, loved him for five, 10 years until I found out about Kuhn. 
Um, but yeah, falsification is the way science moves forward. You have to have a testable hypothesis. You have to have it proven false or not. Um, compared to Bacon, it's definitely not as focused on the subjective problems with a person um, who is doing the science and their background and all that. So a little bit more black and white stuff like that uh, with science is just the science, stick to science, stick to science, whatever, you know, stick to baseball, stick to football kind of stuff. Uh, scientific theories are imagined as hypotheses. Yeah, that have not, I talked about this earlier in my describing it. It's like we're cutting away at some core truth of life. And, you know, that's not really what life, what, what scientists do. Uh, I'm a Kuhn guy. So uh, Kuhnian epistemology, how people actually gain knowledge, is we have idols. We're, we're people. The people who do science are people. And the last two were sirs. So I don't uh, think Kuhn wound up being a sir. He died kind of early in the 90s. So, um, but, well, yeah, his, his thing is focusing on the idols that are relevant now. So the idol that's most relevant now in science is received wisdom. Like that's what we did it for. Like that when I tell you I went to MIT and got a PhD at Caltech and all that stuff, right? The reason I'm telling you that is because that implies that I've learned some stuff, right? That, I learned, that you can learn math and science from me because I learned math and science real good from somebody who knew it real good. Um, yeah, and that's true. That's what I do. I, I know all the paradigms. I can teach you calculus. I can teach you most of the things in this class up to like the bounds of quantum field theory and general relativity. Yeah, a lot of tensor stuff in there that you should probably get somebody else for. But um, basically, the we whenever you get good at, you got good at for a reason. And most people, if you can get grants, you get the grants and then you do it some more. And so that's not really falsifying experiments though, right? So what you're doing is getting good at something and then doing it again and again and again and again. Like, and your H index gets high if you do it a bunch of times and other people care about it, not if you falsified something, right? So we have kind of a problem with incentive in science right now. And not not problem incentive, it's just that there's not always progress to be made, right? Like the odds of falsification go to zero is another way of saying that to say that we, we all wanna make progress on our grants and we're not going to present something that is not progress on a grant. So that's how we have the pitch of dark matter and dark energy and all that stuff is, you know, you have, uh, <laughs> that's a big thing. We gotta figure it out before we can call it something, right? I mean, um, but it, we'll talk about that in a second. Generations pass, blah, blah, blah. Oh, right, because there's no uh, falsification going on, right? I mean, we, we get results that are a little shady, a little bit should be falsifications. Um, but the math is hard and we, we recognize, right? Like I just recognized there earlier. I don't know some of this math, like math, there's a lot of math out there and I'm good at a lot of it, but some of it like, yeah, it would be particularly convenient for me if general relativity did not have to be learned real good because I'm not real great at it. Right. So Kuhn finds a problem with Popper by iterating Popper on himself. So let's say you just keep doing, um, falsifications, even within the paradigm. Well, eventually, even if you do something where you received wisdom and you did it again, you're going to find a problem. And that's going to be eventually catastrophic for you because you have no way to address a big problem. Because if you are just reproducing received wisdom that you're happy about, um, then you are going to have a problem putting that aside and saying, okay, maybe all my received wisdom was wrong, as we do when we find out about dark energy and dark matter. Nonetheless, even after gone to MIT and Caltech and learned about all these physics and chemistry things that are around, and you thought you knew stuff, and every layer of learning is falsification, right? So you that's why when you got to college and learned about stuff from high school, you're like, man, I thought that other thing was right. Nope, falsification. So um, that's, that's science going right, though. That's not science going wrong. Uh, all right, so... Yeah, it's going to be unlikely um, that we have a paradigm shift, right? Because it requires modesty in addition to confidence, which comes in rare packages. And it takes a crucial experiment and the, the means to perform it. So modesty, confidence, means, place. There's a lot of things that have to come together. It doesn't really happen almost ever. Uh, it's kind of happening by accident. So for instance, 1930s, I think is the last time I would say we had a huge paradigm shift based on a crucial experiment. So uh, uh, Dirac had just published a pretty splashy paper where he was like, hey, when you take a square root, you get a plus and a minus, more or less. I mean, it's splashier than that. But, and the minus means uh, antimatter. And so then they found antimatter like right then at the top of Mount Wilson, which is amazing because I, I can see it every morning when I go for a walk. But um, it, they found out right away, yeah, antimatter exists. It's right here. It's coming from the clouds. We don't know why. 
So that was cool. Um, it came from the sun. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, check out that story. But the point is, yeah, that also um, when we talk about Kuhn and paradigm shifting, we have incommensurability, which is the idea that the, the ideas before weren't really wrong, right? They, they just weren't complete, right? Like Einstein wasn't wrong. He just had, didn't have antimatter in there yet. And that's kind of important, right? Because that means we need to reconsider all of Einstein's ideas with antimatter considered. So we'll talk about that soon. Um, but yeah, Dirac is instructive. He made a lot of mistakes in this prediction because it's new. And so he's like throwing ideas out there. Maybe it's an anti anti-proton. No, it's like a thousand times too big for that. So it's not, or a thousand times too small, had to be an anti-electron, whatever it was. Um, and he kept shifting interpretations that, and it kind of avoiding being falsified in a way that we, we have to be careful about in science. So Dirac's amazing. Don't mean to say he's not. I'm just saying he kind of got shifty with these explanations and we're all treating the last one as the right one, even though I don't know if we've explored the full space of related explanations. Happened again with Einstein and Bondi. We love Einstein. We don't really uh, appropriately consider Einstein critically. Okay, um, so yeah, this statement comes up a lot. The standard model is consistent with all known experiments, but we just talked about epistemological models. Is this falsifiable even in the abstract? Consistent with experiments. Uh, I think you can just tinker with that and it just remain true, right? Uh, okay, we just kind of change our model it's consistent with all experiments. What role does peer review play? Does that have anything to do with falsification of anything? I guess, yeah, it has to do with accepting falsification, accepting experiments. But I think more often than not, it's a hindrance. And it's kind of a thing from the 19th century when publishing stuff, you had to have a barrier to it because it was an expensive thing to do publishing stuff. But now it's not expensive. So why do we even need that? I don't think we can. It just ma makes gatekeepers, right? And it's weird to have these gatekeepers. Uh, okay, so bup, bup, bup. weirdly, this is not great color here. Oh yeah, uh, CERN doesn't exactly say consistent with all known experiments. That's kind of what people said in my uh, classrooms and stuff. but. Uh, at CERN, so we'll take that as the like leading scientist explanation. <laughs> no offense to Fermi Lab, I should probably look at their website. But uh, developed in the early 1970s, the standard model has successfully explained almost all experimental results and predicted a wide variety of phenomena, which is true. Uh, but almost all, <laughs> I mean, we were just talking about how science moved forward is falsification. So probably should zone in on that area that's been falsified where we have things that are uh, not consistent with some experimental results. How wrong is false, right? Um, must be pretty small if we're still talking about it, probably just a little wrong, right? Oh, no. Welcome to reality. If you're, if you're not a physicist, you're going to be surprised by this page, but there's a lot of dark matter and dark energy. And what that means is there's a missing isotropic, meaning everywhere pushed to everything, meaning when you use Einstein's equation, ain't there. Whoa. Uh, what is dark matter? A missing anisotropic push here or there. So <laughs> You have everything missing and a bunch more missing. That's a lot missing. Um, so does that mean there are two, two different things and dark energy and dark matter and we need to be looking for one and the other thing? No, it, it could just be one way the standard model is wrong coming into two different observables, right? So that's kind of the whole point of this slide is just philosophically saying that you have a missing anisotropic piece and a missing isotropic piece to your model is just saying you have a 100% completely broken model. It's broken in every way that it could be broken in terms of isotropic versus anisotropic. It's, it's all of the possibilities. It's wrong both ways. So uh, currently we only have an explanation for 4% of the universe. Now, thankfully it's the 4% that's right here, right? I mean, we're pretty good at building computers and I mean, hopefully this recording goes uh, to tape the one part of computers that hasn't been working too well for me recently. But um, for the most part around here, it's amazing. And so we've got to reconcile broadly WMAP. This is the study of like um, the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy pro probe. And it's looking at the um, was it microwave background. So leftover from the beginning of time, we have a thing called the cosmic microwave background. And when you look at the anisotropy, and I said trippy from that, you can get some predictions about like uh, where stuff should be and shouldn't be from uh, a global model of what we know about the universe. And yeah, we get that very little of it is the stuff we know about and very much of it is something else. Um, 
and it gets more and more confident as we do this again and again. This is a bigger probe. It's like using all the biggest instruments in the world out there in space. So, you know, that's pretty bad. We only know 4% of the universe. Um, and that's not the only way it's wrong, right? So the standard model, model is wrong in a bunch of ways. Um, I wrote this slide and realized I should probably tell you what the standard model is. So what is the standard model? I'll do this slide and then go back to the ways it's wrong. Um, it's general relativity plus quantum field theory plus the standard astronomical model because we have all this cosmological evidence now. We can look out and see the stars. We need to have explanations for that too. So Big Bang the, and the hyperinflation theory tacked on. Now, those last pieces are fine. We can tack those onto anything we can talk about later. There's a lot of tacking going on there. We need more explanations. But the first two are not okay. Those don't go together. General relativity and quantum field theory are famously incompatible theories and with occasionally open wars between their founders. Um, Einstein didn't like quantum guys, never did, never came around on it. You know, he said that uh, God does not play dice. And uh, yeah, I don't, uh, he was not... Joking, he did not like the uh, quantum theory, never came around on it. And so, yeah, this slide. Uh, we'll keep going with the Einstein thing for now. Einstein says no dice, um, that general relativity and quantum mechanics are fundamentally different. He didn't like the um, probabilistic universe kind of thing, uh, particularly the idea that you sometimes get one thing and sometimes getting the other without knowing beforehand which one it is doesn't mean there's more to know, um, which is kind of related to the question of uncertainty. So I've always thought that this is probably influenced by a, a tiff that Einstein had earlier with Hilbert and Schrodinger. So not many people know about this because in, in you know history books, Einstein's presented like a god because of our great person fa narrative fallacies as humans. But you know, he wasn't a god. He did uh, almost didn't become anything more than like a failed tutor and a patent clerk or whatever. Um, but somebody took him seriously in academia. And now we all think academia is how he got famous, but that's not that's not it. Um, anyway, so when he was getting famous, though, he he had um, a couple different tiffs with Hilbert and Schrodinger when he was completing the field equations. So he, was, he had been entrenched in academia for a decade since he'd had his miracle year. He had done some of the good parts. He had done equivalence principle, bam, like 1913-14. Hadn't gotten all the way to the final equations. And there's some correspondence between him and Hilbert indicating Hilbert probably got there first. And then he sent him a little postcard saying, nanny, nanny, boo, boo, you have to do this one thing. And Einstein threw away the evidence of that and then published his own thing and said it was first. And so it was like, eh, it's pretty nasty. But Anyway, that's that's why I think academia fosters is these weird rivalries and stuff instead of like, just look at the you guys are doing amazing research, pat each other on the back, each, each of you figure out your cool results, find your crucial experiments, and then yeah, set up some grand wagers or something. Dude, that's the fun part of academia. But um, because he didn't do it the fun way, instead Hilbert uh, Hilbert did this one thing, sent him a little snarky note, and then there's a um, Schrodinger also wrote a public. Uh, paper where he was like, oh, hey, Einstein, you remember how you got the cosmological constant in there? Well, that would mean you'd have negative mass everywhere. You'd have dark energy. Mm, don't want dark energy, do you? And that's why Einstein turned on uh, the idea of a cosmological constant is because the idea, if you moved it to the source side of the equation, it implied dark energy and he hated dark energy. So people have tried to turn it around now because they want to salvage that and salvage um, Einstein. That's not related to the next slide. So let me Finish that point, I guess, that um, people want to pretend Einstein because he created the cosmological constant, which is dark energy, is fine with dark energy, but that's why he considered it a big shame. Didn't like it at all because it means right here, where's the dark energy, right? You have to have the better explanation than like something I can prove is wrong right now by going and like, don't feel it, don't feel it. We don't, we don't observe it here, you know what I mean? And we are here, so it's observably wrong here that there would be dark energy. And so we need a better explanation than that it's just around us, man, or whatever, you know, I, I don't know what we're doing here. Um, so, but, 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 uh, so, okay. People are still trying to do this. Some people do think there's a problem with uncertainty principle that you can know both momentum and uh, position at the same time. Uh, we've got the Pettit lab has biometric gravity. Santilli lab has isodeterminism. Um, there's a few more people. I didn't give everybody a shout out. My apologies. Um, some people really do think quantum mechanics is incomplete. 
uh, EPR, whatever debate, go Google it. Um, not me. Uh, I don't think any of these arguments is physically beautiful, even where they're philosophically nice, like Sakharov and the Janus cosmology having the backwards in time universe, having commutators that do commute instead of the reason we have the uncertainty principle. Those are all fine philosophically, but I just, I don't know. So uh, my question for you is, we have dark matter, dark energy, 96%. So why aren't the theories changing? Why is there not really consideration of new theories in academia? So based on your understanding from earlier slides of Kuhn and Popper, which is more approximated by this behavior, bada bing, I had a little slide in thing here, so I'll just do it for you. It's the only one in the whole lecture. Uh, Kuhn, Kuhn's the one who I think describes what's happening in physics right now more. Um, because dark energy and dark matter are both describing the future in terms of the past. These are examples of incommensurate behavior. Nobody's ever gonna read a paper on what, uh, cold dark matter or whatever. The, the, when you add adjectives to stuff that's gonna be nonsense in the future, you're not gonna be known in the future. Um, so anyway, scientists are just people. So the reason we're call, talking about dark matter and dark energy is we don't wanna talk directly about our theories being wrong. So we say, oh, this one way it's going wrong can be quantified this thusly, you know, as this much dark energy, and this much dark matter, and then the right part. And so we focus on the right part, forget about the wrong part. Um, but it's dangerous to, to examine the wrong part, right? Because you have grants, your family depends on your paycheck for that, thankfully, to my wife, Susanna, working in, the, uh, in Hollywood for the last several years. Our paycheck does not depend on that. So I can think about crazy stuff like this. Um, okay, so the paradigms, what's the problem here? It's what the problem was a problem for Einstein. Um, just like in classes uh, you had right after the scientific method, most scientists just want to learn stuff and then apply it, right? So you thought the scientific method was right probably up until you saw this video. Most people, um, scientists want what they were learned in college and grad school to be right because they spent a lot of time and effort in college and grad school. And in some, many cases are still doing it for a uh, job and they don't want their whole job to be for nothing, right? So if you're looking for neutrinos, you want neutrinos to matter, man. You want them to matter pretty good. Uh, anyway, so grant propagation is really what's happening though. I mean, if you look at and talk to any scientist, that's why they have to be a scientist somehow, right? So they're either old money or having grants or I guess selling books. That's the other route for theoretical physicists these days. Um, but nowhere in publisher parish, H index, et cetera, is attempt falsifications. There's no benefit in the current model to attempting falsifications, there's no scientific method occurring. Definitely not of the old variety, not even of the popper variety. Oh, I'm sorry, not of the popper variety. Plenty of the old variety. We're definitely doing experiments, and but it's more of the experiments where we're like, I got what I expected to find to nine digits. I got to what I expected to find to 10 digits. I got what I expected to find to 11 digits, which is, I mean, something, but uh, anyway, there's a lack of, incentive to do what needs to be done. So it's impressive that the WMAP thing happened at all, right? I mean, within this context, I think it's it's uh, says something about the cosmology community that they're willing to point out, hey, it looks like a bunch of stuff wrong here, guys. Um, so anyway, we'll keep it on epistemology, hopefully a little bit here, and talk about how paradigms are prisons and use Einstein's as the example. So Einstein had his miracle year before he was in academia. All the stuff, stuff he won his Nobel for, all the stuff we talk about most of the time. For him, special relativity, Brownian motion is what he won his Nobel for, or photoelectric effect, I forget. It was one of the things before the stuff we know him for now. Um, but mass energy equivalence, all the stuff he did before he got into academia. He did this when he was a tutor, when he was hanging out, you know, doing patent clerking, probably reading a couple of people talking about time and time on railroads and stuff. Um, I would guess based on the content of his, his imagination. Uh, but yeah, so he did four amazing things in one or two or three years right before he got into academia. And then, whoo, such a slog, 13 years to come up with general relativity, even if you give him five to 10 to come up with the equivalence principle, which was amazing. All these are amazing. All five, six, whatever ideas Einstein had are amazing. But you got to give it to him. Most of the ideas were right there before he got in academia. And then once he got comfortable and had academia behind him, he had 40 years of nothing. So 
I guess that's my, for, for those of you who are at home being uncomfortable scientists, take advantage. <laughs> this is the time. Once you get comfortable, you're going to be involved in petty spats with random rich people or whatever, like Einstein did for the last 50 years of his life. And hopefully you get one general relativity. I mean, most people don't. Um, so yeah, and maybe just avoid academia altogether is maybe another point of this slide and how I feel. Um, so yeah. So what happens if we do challenge the paradigm and fail, you know, um, good. That's fine. We, we have at least proposed a crucial experiment, had a test of the theory. We attempt, we got a falsification. We did the real Popperian thing. That's the thing, like to get past these Kuhnian hurdles where we're not testing theories, that's all we have to do is real Popperian testing. Again, right past the, to get the crucial experiment. Crucial experiment is just a falsification. It's just one where we find something crazy, but we can't find that when we go around calling stuff dark, right? I mean, that's, how, how can you, yeah, that's why people make fun of science. You guys have beliefs too. You do. These are the beliefs. So let's think about what we have to do to get past our current beliefs. I've noticed a, a bit of latency when I click the button. So click the button again. It's going to do it twice now. Uh, so we have to do a, a more crucial experiment than the W map, than 96% wrong, than all this dark matter and dark energy. We have to do something that's 200% wrong. So we're specifically, I think we're going to recreate Newton's experiment, the apple dropping down but with a negative mass apple. And if it falls up instead of down, then boom, that's crazy. It's more shocking and you, you shouldn't be able to put it aside. Um, so if anything does that, that would be amazing, right? I, I think we'd have to say, hey, something's wrong with the current theory, we gotta change it. Um, and yeah, did you know there are, uh, there are three experiments. It might surprise you, most people who haven't heard me rant this at you before to find there are three different experiments at CERN uh, with various types of anti-hydrogen. I think, I thought there was anti-helium in there, but maybe it's just anti-hydrogen, three different ways testing to see, does it fall up or down? And so we'll have the answer probably five to 10 years, but I wouldn't expect very many sigmas. They can't create very much of the antimatter yet. So maybe we find it with these experiments, but I've looking back to the last guy who did this, uh, 20 years ago, and he was talking about how the CERN experiments were going to do it for him too. I guess he didn't foresee the popularity of the Higgs boson, et cetera. But um, so yeah, that's what I'd expect for uh, for the future. Um, anyway, so that's pretty much it for the class for today. We've talked about kind of crucial experiments. Huh, I think my thing has frozen. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that's probably it for the lecture on epistemology. We'll revisit it a little bit next time as we move into foundations of quantum mechanics. If you are reading along at home, follow all the links, go read about these experiments. They're cool. Um, they are going to tell about antimatter. That's how, that's, these will be the crucial experiments. Um, and read Griffiths. Uh, Griffiths, this uh, introduction to quantum mechanics, very clear about what's going on with quantum mechanics. Um, chapters one to three. It's going to be a historical introduction to quantum mechanics. We'll talk about that next time. But okay, doke. let's stop recording and see you guys next time. Oh yeah. And uh, I should have said this way earlier, but like and subscribe to this channel so you can find when I post new content. Um, thanks a lot. And this has been Evans Imagines Negative Mass Antimatter, first class on epistemology. Right. Bye guys.